Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. It is indeed a day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. We love you, Lord. We thank you for loving us first. Lord, we enter into that portion of Luke's Gospel where Jesus' trial is moving on and his crucifixion is near. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. I ask now that you would anoint my tongue to declare this word clearly this morning and anoint every ear that will hear it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we finished Luke 22 last week, and we got to hear how Peter denied and denied and denied knowing Jesus. We also heard what a look can do. A little look from Jesus brought into Peter's mind those words flooding into his mind before the rooster crowed. Uh, you will deny me three times. Today we begin Luke 23. In verse 1 we read, Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Well, what's the first thing that we notice about what the multitude led to? Jesus to Pilate said. What's the very first thing? The very first thing I notice is this. They were lying. They were lying. Jesus never advocated that people were to stop paying taxes to Caesar. Instead, when presented with a Roman coin, he asked, whose image is on this? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Whether Pilate knew they were lying, well, we don't know that. He doesn't even address the issue of paying taxes. He turned to Jesus and he said, are you the king of the Jews? What's interesting is the multitude hadn't stated that Jesus was the king of the Jews. Instead, saying that he himself is Christ the king. They never mentioned king of the Jews. They never mentioned it like that title, you know. And so Pilate is the one that brought that up. Was Jesus the king of the Jews? Yes. Yes. In fact, just this week, I was going through some comments on a website and one commenter said, I only have one question for you guys out there. Was Jesus the king of the Jews? Oddly, nobody for a full day answered it. And I'm like, oh. I mean, I figured nobody answered it because they, they didn't want to get into a co commentary fight with it, you know. And so finally I said, yes, he is the king of the Jews. But he's also the king of all nations. Because he is the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. So, um, was Jesus the king of the Jews? Yes. But how did Pilate know that? To even ask the question, because the multitude hadn't said that. And we don't exactly know how Pilate knew to phrase that question in that way. But he did it. Of course, he's governor of the area. You know, he's governor of that area. Jerusalem was his jurisdiction. And more than likely, he was in the business of knowing everything that the Jews were up to. Because it was a Roman province now. And Rome occupied it. So, it would be natural probably a requirement to know what was going on in that city. You know, hearing all the scuttlebutt that was going on. Why? 
to keep everybody in line. All right? Having asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, it is as you say. Well, maybe the multitude who had brought Jesus to Pilate thought, yes, we got him. Caesar won't tolerate a rival. This, however, is not what they heard. Verse 4 says, so Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. <laughs> they were probably going, what? <laughs> How Pilate reached this conclusion in such a short time is really unknown. And of course, we don't know what other words were exchanged. What are the questions? What other conversation there had been. We have what we haven't recorded, right? But, you know, maybe he had also heard the scuttlebutt in town about how much Jesus was hated by the religious leaders. Or, it could be that maybe Pilate didn't expect Jesus to tell him the truth. I mean, how many arrested people say, yep, I'm guilty. I mean, what? When we get an accident, what does the insurance company say? Don't say anything. You know, don't admit to doing anything wrong, okay? So he might be going, somebody's telling the truth here. Wow. He must not be guilty, right? So, you know, we don't know exactly how Pilate came so quickly to this conclusion. He said, I find no fault with this man. But he was met with the crowd. They became more fierce saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee, to this place, meaning Jerusalem. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Uh, I can see Pilate going, oh my goodness, he's out of my hands. Let Herod deal with it. He belongs to Herod anyway, his jurisdiction led him to deal with it. Uh, it's also very wonderful that Herod just happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. He's probably there for Passover. But I can see Pilate, you know, breathing a sigh of relief that Herod's there and he can pass him off. Verse 8, now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a, glory, a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they'd been at enmity with each other. Did Herod really think Jesus would answer him? His motive for hoping to see Jesus do a miracle was not a good motive. He just wanted to see some miracle. You know, he thought Jesus was going to be a song and dance man. He just did, you know, hop and do and dance and whatever. Jesus isn't like that. You know, the enemy likes to show off, but not Jesus, and neither should his followers. Uh, let me just give you an example. Years ago, I heard this story, I read this story, of... Uh, some people, they were going in and out, you know, through an airport. You know how they got those long hallways to go to and from airplanes and so forth. Well, there was a crowd around this one guy. I mean, there was space enough to where you could see what he was doing, and basically he was doing different kinds of tricks, okay? You couldn't really tell what, you know, why, you know, how they were happening and things like that, but, but he had the crowd mesmerized because of what he was doing. It didn't make any sense. You know, things were, things were rotating in the air, and, you know, there wasn't any rhyme or reason for why that was. 
Well, a, another guy that was walking down the corridor of the airport realized what spirit was behind this man doing these things. So he took his position in a spot across from him and started praying. Not, you know, not loudly, but just started praying. And then, you know, all of a sudden, everything that the, the magician fellow sorcerer had been doing didn't work anymore. Everything that he had had floating in the air dropped to the ground. And so that man started looking around to see who the troublemaker for him was. And he set his eyes on the Christian, the believer who knew what to do. And he packed up his things and left. This man, he wanted to make a show of what he could do. Why? To entice the crowd probably more the little ones, the younger ones, into getting into the evil and the wickedness that he himself was into. He wanted to make an entryway for them into evil, and so he was starting with doing tricks, spiritual tricks. But there was a believer who knew what to do and shut him down. Jesus isn't a circus performer. His servants, us, people who pray for the sick, we're not circus performers either. We pray for people to get well. We pray for the injured to get healed, but we don't make a big deal out of it. You know, we certainly aren't supposed to do things on the men, you know. You know, when somebody says jump, we don't say how high. You know, that sort of thing. What's really sad is that Jesus' accusers were the religious leaders. And they vehemently accused Jesus before Herod. But we also know that they were the establishment. And we know how well the establishment likes to see change. They are called the establishment for a reason. They are not called change agents. Okay? You know... They did not want to lose their prestige. They did not want to lose their influence. They did not want to lose whatever it was that they gained by being part of the establishment. So having gotten nothing from Jesus, Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate. Verse 13. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accused him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And they, he, they were sent back to Herod because that's the jurisdiction that Jesus rightly belonged in. And indeed, nothing deserving death has been done by him. What's interesting is they have not, I mean, this is the first time we see the word death. But I don't doubt that there have been other times that the religious leaders had brought other people they wanted to get rid of to the Roman authority there in Jerusalem. And so Pilate was probably assuming that they were bringing Jesus to him because they wanted him dead. Since nothing deserving death has been done by him. The back and forth from Pilate to Herod and back again, it was not without its warmth. It confirmed Jesus' innocence in the civilian court. Remember when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. There was that period of time, we know, when the lambs were being examined, because only the blemishless, spotless lambs could be sacrificed, that the religious leaders were questioning Jesus. And finally, after they questioned so much, they finally stopped asking him questions. He had passed their tests. They didn't realize that was what they were doing, but he had passed their tests. Now he had passed the test of the civil authorities. So Jesus had been... Um, 
qualified as the perfect spotless lamb who could go to the cross and be the sacrifice for sin that we needed. Verse 16. Pilate says, I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. The words of verse 17 in parentheses will kind of appear out of the blue. You know, like they don't have any kind of context. But to people in Jerusalem at Passover time, they knew what the tradition was. And they knew uh, what Pilate was talking about. It made perfect sense to them. You know, how it became a tradition at Passover that uh, the governor would release a criminal to the people, you know, somebody who was facing death, we don't know how that came about. But that was the tradition. And so he fought to release Jesus to them. But the religious leaders already had a candidate in mind. And so they all cried out at once, saying, away with this man, meaning Jesus, and release to us the rest. who had been thrown in prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Barabbas, why in the world Barabbas? Anyone but Jesus would have worked for these people. Anyone but Jesus. But actually, Barabbas was the perfect man to be released. Why? Because of his name. Isn't it interesting? We know that Jesus is the Son of the Father. Right? In Hebrew, the phrase, Son of the Father, is Barabbas. Isn't that interesting? What's even more interesting about this man, Barabbas, is his first name. Apparently, allegedly, supposedly, we don't know for sure, but Matthew has his first name as Jesus, Yeshua. So here you have a man called Yeshua Barabbas, or Jesus, son of the Father, and we have Jesus, son of the capital letter, Father. Two men by the same name. Now it is true that in the Greek manuscripts, at least in the one that I have, and the one that I looked up online, they have Barabbas' first name in brackets. All right? And I, I looked up what the textual meaning of just having a word in brackets means. It means that the textual critics, the textual critics weren't all that convinced that Yesun, which is the accused form of the word Jesus, named Jesus, was original to the text. However, I believe it was just like God to put a man called Jesus Barabbas next to the one who is Jesus Barabbas. And let the crowd choose which one. Which one they wanted released to them. And we know the world has been steeped in sin and evil and wickedness since the time that sin entered into the world. Jesus was the one, the bringer of life, right? What did the crowds choose? The man who represented darkness. He represents the world. The religious leaders chose the man who was representative of the world, the darkness, the evil. They did not choose the one who was light and life and goodness and love. That is so telling. That is so telling. Unlike every other person in the world, then or now, Barabbas could literally say, Jesus took my place. Because in the physical, Jesus took his place. You know, for all of us, Jesus took our place, 
But he didn't physically take our place. He took our place spiritually for all time. I mean, all of our sins were on him. So were Barabbas. But Barabbas could say he took my place. Barabbas, because of sedition and murder, he was facing death by crucifixion. But he was set free. Jesus took his place. The religious leaders chose a rebel over the Son of God. Wouldn't we like to know what Barabbas was like after that? We don't know anything about him. But our questions could be, did, did he ask anything of the disciples after that? Who was Jesus? What? You know? I mean, we don't know if Jesus' death for Barabbas made a difference in Barabbas' life after that. It has made a difference in countless lives since that time. Millions and millions of people come to faith in Jesus knowing that he was our substitute. God put on him the judgment we all deserve. Millions of people have believed that. Millions of people know that because of what Jesus did, we do not have to face eternity in hell. We can believe that Jesus, our substitute, has bridged the gap between us and heaven. I believe, I believe, over at Emmanuel Lutheran, their sign-out says, said, who would have thought that Jesus could build a bridge with two pieces of wood? A bridge between earth and heaven. Well, I know they probably would have liked to have added to their sign, but their sign can only hold so many words. But the full text would have been, who would have thought that Jesus could build a bridge between earth and heaven with two pieces of wood and three nails? But he did. He bridged the gap between earth and heaven, but between us and the Father by him going to the cross. So now, what we read in John's Gospel, John says, to all who believe, he gives the power, he gives the right to become children of God. Children not born of flesh, but of the Spirit. So now we are sons and daughters of the Father. That is just tremendously wonderful. Amen.